world-renowned astrophysicist Neil deGrasse Tyson. He's our special guest in this one-on-one -on -one interview. Hello, I'm Arnand Naidu, and this is The Heat. Neil deGrasse Tyson is an astrophysicist with the American Museum of Natural History and he has a global following because of his extraordinary ability to give us insights into the cosmos. He's host of the show Star Talk and he's a best-selling author. His latest book is Letters from an Astrophysicist. Neil, great to have you with us. Thanks for having me. My first time on your program. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. Uh -huh. Now, you are renowned. But it's called The Heat, so it's I don't know. <laughs> the Heat. Well, you can see the atoms behind you there. <laughs> That's what's moving around. All right. right. Yeah. You're renowned for being able to explain complex science, things like astrophysics, to non-scientists, people like me, millions of people around the world. Uh, what fascinates you the most about the universe? Uh, first, I think it's a hilarious place. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think if you can find the humor in things, people, people uh, warm up to learning uh, more. I mean, you, if, if you learn something while you're laughing, you'll want to learn more of that. And so, so, I like celebrating uh, what's fun about the universe and or what's intriguing or what's mind-blowing. Mm -hmm. And the, I, I would say what you're crediting me with the ability to translate complex topics, it's, it's, it's not so much a translation of complex topics. What I've found works very well is if I maintain a, a, an operating level of awareness of pop culture, and imagine I have sort of pop culture tools in my sort of Batman utility belt. Mm -hmm. Then when I'm describing science to you, if I know some pop culture thing that you're comfortable with, I'll find ways to attach science to it. Because you already care and know about the pop culture. I don't have to teach you that. But if I attach a pop culture element to it, then you will walk away with a foundation on which you to base the science that you just Give learned. me an example of that. Well, here in the United States, just as an example, I was channel surfing once and I came across an American football game and it was sudden death overtime, where the first person to score, the first team to score in this period wins the game. And so they went to kick the field goal, all right? This was a half the length of the football field. And I saw the ball tumble and it hit the left upright of the goalpost and then bounced in for the win. And everybody celebrated. I said, hmm, did a quick calculation. And I noted that this score was aided by a one third of an inch deflection to the right because of Earth's rotation. I tweeted that. People lost their minds. <laughs> People, <laughs> they, you know, the, the um, there's a lot of excitement around it, a lot of anger uh, that Earth would help one team and not the other. Right. But uh, I got people to think about what's called the Coriolis force. This is the force that that creates the circulation in in hurricanes, and it forces clouds to move off to the side of the low pressure system rather than directly to it. That was a way that I added a little bit of science to something that people were already familiar with. Is there still a lot about the universe that we are still trying to understand? Oh, yeah. In fact, most of the universe we know very little about. And it's, um, we should all be fascinated by the fact that we can even make that sentence. 96% of what is driving the universe, uh, we have no idea what that is, yet we can measure it. So that's particularly uh, intriguing and frustrating. So you might have heard of dark matter and dark right. energy. Mm -hmm. These dark matter is, it really should be called dark gravity because 85% of all the gravity we measure in the universe has no known origin. It's not planets, stars, galaxies, black holes, clouds. It's nothing that we have ever identified. It's just coming from some mysterious place but we measure it. That's 85% of the gravity. Then the universe is expanding. It's not only expanding, it's accelerating. So there's some pressure operating against gravity in the vacuum of space that we can measure. We call that dark energy. We don't know what ca what's causing that either. And you add those two up, it's 95, 96% 
of all that drives the universe. And everything we know and love, the chemistry, the biology, the geology, physics, all of the established scientific understanding of the universe mm -hmm. occupies that remaining 4%. You know, astrophysics is such an exact science. As you point out, you can measure this. Uh, there's a certain amount of precision to it. But you have a gripe. In your new book, uh, you have a chapter on science denial. And you write that, and I'm quoting here, some people think that science is overvalued and rampant with smug researchers. How do you deal with those people who deny science? Yeah, that's, it's hard. These are people who deny science. By the way, many of them are denying science while simultaneously using their smartphone to call. Okay. <laughs> the smartphone which is communicating with satellites, which involves space and technology and quantum physics. So I think, you know, science doesn't every day have a, have a public relations department telling you, hey, what you just, what, this little thing that happened to you today, it was enabled by this discovery. Right. This doesn't, we don't do that. There's not a budget for that. So I think people, over time can take science for granted. We've flown in an airplane, right? And there you are going, uh, forgive the American units, 500 miles an hour right. at 31,000 feet for five hours. And you'll come off the plane saying, you know, my soup was cold. <laughs> 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 or, or the internet didn't was work. slow, yeah. okay? That would be your biggest complaint. Well, how about the fact that the plane didn't fall out of the sky? That the plane, you were in a comfortable seat, that it wasn't bumpy. There's, you know, there are things we now take for granted. So, so science denial, uh, I, and sometimes it goes deeper, right? right. The people who deny uh, the human effect on climate change and the rise of flat earthers. Where did that come from? People think Earth is flat. I think that's a conspiracy among people because they want to be the first to fly into space, because we want to get rid of them. Hey, you want, get out, you want to see Earth is round? Here, we'll put you up first into orbit, right. and then you'll come back and they get the free first flight. I think that they're all banking on that. You talk about climate change. That, of course, is one of the defining challenges of our time. Uh, how concerned are you about the viability of the Earth to survive this? Oh, Earth doesn't care. <laughs> Earth as a planet, it, it, it'll be here before, during, and after anything we do to it. So when people say save Earth, they really mean save humans on the Earth. Right. That's really what's going on there. Or, or save the ecosystem. Right. Earth as a planet does not care. Earth has survived much worse. Asteroid strikes, uh, continental rearrangements that change the climate in the day for those reasons. So, so, um, so just want to make that clear. Mm -hmm. What climate change will affect is civilization and some of the biggest consequences of it, the most visible early consequences, is the melting of, of ice that you find on Greenland, primarily Greenland and Antarctica. That ice has been landlocked for millions of years. And, well, not millions, but tens of thousands of years. Most right. of that ice has been there. And so if you, if you start losing that ice, it melts into the ocean, ocean's levels rise. There are entire countries, for example, in the South Pacific, where this average sea level is not much, the, 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 the elevation of the country is not much above sea level. There'll be waters that'll just wipe out those entire countries. Most important cities of the world are on the water's edge, be it ocean or lakes or rivers, historically, of course, for transportation, for commerce. These cities are at risk of completely flooding in this new world. This will alter what we today call civilization. So you mentioned civilization, talk about human beings. Will we be able to survive that? Will we be able to adapt to these changes? Our species will certainly survive it. Yeah. It's just what we value most in civilization, which was very hard earned. Uh, we've had relatively stable climate since the end of the last ice age. Mm -hmm. All right, that's when agriculture came up in the last 10 and 20,000 years. Agriculture requires a stability of climate, of region, of uh, soils. And on that, on the back of agriculture, we built the stability of our civilization. That's why we're basically no longer nomadic. You're not following the herd for your food supply. But will we change? For instance, you know, we hear stories about the earth getting so hot that it'll be very difficult for us to even go outside because it'll be too hot. 
will our bodies change 2,000 years from now? Will you and I look the same? Well, so, uh, so they're the forces of evolution, but those take much longer than what will surely be our own ability to control our genome. Right? We, we, we just go in and, and alter genes. We, we will very soon have the power to do that. And you want to make sure you need sort of ethics panels alongside that as right. we go forward so that we do, do right by this technology. Ideally, you would initially uh, uh, invoke this power to rid our species of certain diseases that some are congenital, some are developed later, but you, can, you, you might be able to go in and, and introduce resistance to certain diseases, possibly completely wipe out cancer. Consider that 100 year, 120 years ago, at the turn of the last century, if you ask people, what are you most concerned about going forward? People say, well, I'm worried about food and starvation. I'm worried about tuberculosis. You know, there are things people worried about that have been basically solved. So going forward, we, yes, we, we will survive it. It'll be warmer outside. We'll, we might have more air conditioning. Or in principle, you could possibly alter the genes to accommodate this better. But uh, that's not, I don't worry about that, that it's be slightly warmer. I worry that New York City won't be there anymore. I, I worry that we'll lose the greatest cities in the world and the, and the landmarks and the monuments that were built along the water's edge. Let's go back to the universe. Uh, could we're always be, in the universe. We're always in the universe, <laughs> but I want to get up there. <laughs> um, could there be life elsewhere? So if you look at what we're made of, what life is made of, you find, hey, these ingredients, these base ingredients, hydrogen, uh, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, they're everywhere in the universe in high abundance. That's fact number one. Fact number two, the history of life on Earth shows that almost as soon as life could form on Earth, it did. About a hundred million year period after Earth cooled down from its formation epoch, Within 100 million years, which sounds like a long time, right. but compared to four and a half billion, that's, that's like this. So Earth figured out how to turn organic molecules into self-replicating life very quickly. That's fact number two. Fact number three, the universe has been here 14 billion years. So you have the rapidity with which life was formed. You have the prevalence of common ingredients across the universe, and you have a baseline of time that is ample to generate life, we think, in many, if not most places you might look in the universe. So yeah, anyone who studied the problem would say it, it would be inexcusably egocentric to suggest we are the only life in the universe. Will we be able at some stage to access the other life out there? I don't see why not. Mm -hmm. So most life, just based on the history of life on Earth, if you throw a dart, at a planet that had life. You do that for Earth. Most of the time you'll hit Earth when there was microorganisms right. or very simple life. That's what Earth, when Earth had life, that was like most of the time, that, that's all you get. So maybe that's what's common in the universe, just microorganisms. But that's, that'd be great for biology, but what people who, who watch movies really want <laughs> are, are like aliens that you might talk to and you know, with antennae or ray guns or something. So, so that we, we don't know, what we might call intelligent life. Uh, the real challenge there is, are, would any other life consider us to be intelligent? Why are we, but you know, who defined us as intelligent? We did, right? right? So what does that even mean to do so? And uh, maybe aliens haven't visited us because they saw no sign of intelligent life on Earth. And when we talk about the creation of Earth, uh, how things began, we often hear about the Big Bang Theory. What exactly is the Big Bang Theory? Yeah, so, well, technically the Big Bang Theory was a very successful TV show. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> That's and right. also, Big Bang is a very successful Korean pop group. Right. Okay, so if you, if you do a, a search on these two, you'll get those two before you come to the origin of the universe. Right. And I'm, I'm, I'm still, I don't know if that's good or bad yeah. that these two, these terms have become so pop culturized. Right. But um, if you look at the universe, if you look far away, you see the universe not as it is 
but as it once was, because light takes time to reach you. Light takes time from you to reach me. It, this was, you are, I see you not as you are in this moment, but as you were five billionths of a second ago. And you look marvelous over it. You haven't changed Thank much. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> so, so, but the farther away an object is, the farther in the past you are getting the information of what it once was. In the universe, we can see back in time. And when we do this, what we notice is that the universe was smaller in the past. It was hotter in the past. If you run the clock back, you say, well, is there a point where the whole universe was all in one place at some supremely high temperature? Yes. That was 13.8 billion years ago. So if you get that running backwards, then what does that look like running forwards? It looks like a Big Bang. Mm -hmm. And so that's where we get this. Actually, the Big Bang was assigned to this phenomenon by someone who was skeptical that it was really the case. And he said it pejoratively. Oh, this Big Bang. He said, hey, that's a good term. We're going to keep it. So, so the Big Bang gives birth to space, time, energy. Um, and out of this, you get the formation of stars and, and later on, planets orbiting stars because planets are made of ingredients that are formed a little bit later. So the earliest of the universe, you would not have expected planets to be there, or life, life as we know it. So uh, all the evidence we've gathered on the history of the universe is consistent with this model of the universe being birthed in an explosion. And so it's not a matter of whether you believe in it, the evidence points to it. And in one of my books, not this one, I let off my earliest page in it. I said, the universe is under no obligation to make sense to you. <laughs> Let's talk about space exploration. It's mm -hmm. something that uh, catches the imagination of everyone. I mean, since the 1915, when exploration started, we've made great strides. A lot has happened. There's now private companies that are sending vehicles into space, lots of money being spent. How important is space exploration to us? Yeah, I'm so. I don't like imparting my values of space onto other people. Mm -hmm. the, I, I fully accept the likelihood that there are people who say, we have problems on Earth. I don't, I don't have the patience to go into space, or the money, or the time, or effort. I, I get that. What I do is simply highlight for them what could be the benefits that they should not uh, overlook. For example, let's go back 30,000 years. We're all in a cave. And I look outside the cave, and oh, there's a mountain out there. And there's a valley, and there's a river. I want to go explore that. And you're going to say, no, we have cave problems that we have to solve. <laughs> Can't leave the cave until we solve cave problems. Then you can go outside. So when I hear people say, let's not explore space because we have Earth problems, I think of that same conversation transported into a cave 30,000 years ago. Right. What you do not know is what solutions to our current problems will be found in the exploration of space, in the exploration of other planets. Venus has a runaway greenhouse effect. It's, it's you know, 500 degrees Celsius on Venus. You could cook a pizza on your windowsill in four seconds, okay? That's hot. Something bad happened on Venus. I want to understand that. That's one neighbor on one side of us, on the left. On the right, we have Mars. Mars once had liquid running water coursing on its surface. It's bone dry today. There is no water. We think it went into a permafrost beneath the surface. But understanding that will certainly give us insights into the future history of Earth, becoming better shepherds of this thing that is sustaining us, that we call our planet. So space, uh, I'll add another one, which is a little more obscure. I had a professor in college who specialized in molecules in space. And he discovered a new phenomenon of physics called nuclear magnetic resonance, where the nucleus of an atom resonates with radiation that passes through it. And it changes the radiation out on the other side. He won a Nobel Prize for this. This discovery, in the hands of a medical technologist, said, hey, I can make a machine that can analyze the molecules of the human body using this technique. That is now the magnetic resonance imager, the MRI, arguably 
one of the most potent tools in the arsenal of the medical doctor, to diagnose your condition without cutting you open. That came from space. Maybe it should have a big sign on the side of it, derived from space, all right? And that would help change people's uh, awareness and sensitivity and valuation of what it is to explore. Just remember, we're on a moat, a, a speck of dust called Earth, right. and this is vast universe just waiting to be explored. A lot of things came from space, didn't it? Velcro. Yeah, that's what they say. I haven't re-verified that, <laughs> yeah. but I wouldn't say, let's go to space so we can have Velcro. Velcro. Uh, I would say, by the way, there's a cosmic perspective right. that comes that you, don't, you didn't even bargain for. Mm -hmm. For example, uh, when was the first Earth Day? It was 1970. Uh, and I know the laws in the United States, but I think there were tandem laws elsewhere in the world. Uh, we banned leaded gas in, when was it, 1972 or 73? We banned DDT around that same time. The Environmental Protection Agency was signed into law by a Republican president in 1970. All of these awarenesses and sensitivities to Earth occurred while we were going to the moon. Not before, not after. And I submit to you that when we first went to the moon in 1968, when they orbited the moon and looked and took the photo of Earthrise over the lunar surface, that we changed spiritually, culturally, intellectually. There was Earth as nature intended you to see it, not with color-coded countries with wars being fought, as they certainly were in 1968. There was oceans and land and clouds, adrift in the emptiness of space with no one coming to save us from ourselves. We went to the moon to explore the moon and we discovered Earth for the first time. Can you even put a price tag on that? Not so long ago, China sent a vehicle up to the moon, went to the far side of the moon. How significant was that? Uh, that's great. I think more people go to the moon. A moon is actually a big place. I mean, it's small compared to Earth, but if you just go and put a lander you, or, or a, a rover, it'll, it'll, it's got its zone where it can explore, but you want to put more things in more places just so you can learn what else is there. India attempted this. It's hard. You know, space exploration is hard. Mm -hmm. So, so... I think the more countries that get involved, the, the better, because then more places in these targeted uh, uh, destinations can be explored. And then it's, there's opportunity for international collaboration, which is always a good thing when you're doing something big and audacious and expensive. So and the back side of the moon, uh, the far side of the moon, <laughs> is underexplored. And so uh, the more you can get from that, the better. It's hard to communicate from the back side of the moon. You need right. repeaters or an orbiter that you can transmit the signal up and then come back to Earth. The moon only shows one side of itself to Earth. Mm -hmm. So there's a far side and a near side. But there is no dark side of the moon, right. all right? All sides of the moon get sunlight. Would there be a time when there'd be some kind of permanent or semi-permanent settlement on the moon? You know, if you look at the explorers of the 15th and 16th century, going where no one else had gone before, uh, not by those routes, you know, months at sea. Uh, this took, uh, and there was high risk, uh, illness and death, and many people did not survive the round trip. So when they got to their destinations and they got off their ships, they could breathe the air, okay? There were, like, natives there to greet them. There, there were already other humans there, typically. And they could eat the fruit on the vines. And the trees in these new places were made of wood, just as they were in the old world. So they could repair their ships. When you travel to the moon, no, none of that is true. Same with Mars. So if you're going to go to the moon and we have a habitat, it's going to be some Earth-like habitat. So is that really settling the moon? It's just settling an Earth-like place on the moon. So for me, if I think long-term, what I'd love to have happen is that we terraform Mars. Great word, terraform. You, you seed the soils and the atmospheres in ways that, that oxygen gets created, that water gets returned to the surface, and you turn Mars into an Earth-like environment. Then you can ship people there and set up a colony without requiring a spacesuit to exit your front door. I think that's a more sensible concept of a, of a, of a colony. 
rather than always requiring a spacesuit where you can't exit the, 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 the habitat uh, just to, to, to explore. Do we face any dangers on Earth from space? You know, we hear of objects in space, celestial bodies traveling at terrifying speeds. Recently, uh, we heard about the asteroid called 99942 Apophis. Apophis, yeah. Apophis. Uh -huh. uh, that's expected to cruise past Earth in 2029. Oh, 2029, right. Yes, yes, 2029. Yeah. So, so uh, yeah, Ap Apophis, uh, there was a trend for a while when asteroid orbits, if they crossed Earth, we named them after like terrifying things. <laughs> so Apophis is the Egyptian god of darkness and evil. <laughs> so because all, they will eventually strike Earth if you do the orbital mechanics of it. It's just a matter of when. So yes, the solar system is a shooting gallery and you want to protect ourselves from that. That poses an existential risk as a minimum to regions where such large asteroids will strike. Apophis is the size of a stadium, okay? A huge stadium plus all of the, the right. seats and everything. So that's, that's large by close approach standards. So you wanna be able to deflect those. You need a, a, a defense plan in place. That would have to be an international plan, I would think. Because you don't want just one country being able to d deflect it. In the, in the following, for the following reason. You might say, well, it's not headed our way, so why should we care? You don't want that to ever be the sentiment of whoever is in charge. You want it to be a collective thing. We are all together to protect Earth no matter where on Earth it strikes. And if it's large enough, no matter where it hits, it'll affect everybody on Earth. It can change the climate. This is what happened with the dinosaurs. Right. An asteroid the size of Mount Everest struck and it affected life forms all around the Earth, rendering 70% of all species extinct, including the big dinosaurs that we all know and love from movies. So yeah, that's uh, asteroids, very bad. One final question, Neil, and that is, is science moving or advancing too fast? I'm thinking of things like artificial intelligence. We don't have an infrastructure, a legal infrastructure in place to guard us against what artificial intelligence can do. It's being used for facial recognition, it's being used... Machines can now interview you for a job. The humble polygraph is now a very sophisticated machine. Yeah, I mean, the advances in science have always carried risk. I think that's not a new fact. But we can ask whether AI, what they call generalized AI, where you... This is an intelligence where it will learn on its own no matter what is in front of it, rather than specialized AI. For example, you don't need a robot to drive your car. The car is the robot, right? Mm -hmm. So the car is its own kind of AI, yeah. but it's, the car is not otherwise um, engaging the rest of your life in solutions to your problems. Mm -hmm. So the part of the risk, I think, is being well explored in, in science fiction. AI taken to limits will decide that humans, uh, maybe we should all start behaving. Right. Because if AI becomes our overlord, they might decide that Earth is better off without us, and AI takes over. So these kinds of storylines are being explored right now in fiction and in um, uh, science fiction in particular, of course. So yes, I think we need, is it an ethics panel? Is it uh, some sensible people in tandem with these discoveries so that we can not only understand the risks but mitigate them and perhaps set in regulations and laws so that we don't become the victims of our own uh, inventions. Dr. Neil deGrasse Tyson, thank you so much for being with us. Thanks for having me. And the book is Letters from an Astrophysicist. Great to have you with us. And that's all we have time for. Neil deGrasse Tyson, thanks for joining us. You've been watching The Heat. Science just fixed me in my